It was a perfect July beach day. July 2016, fresh from my recent surgery, leaning on my walker on the pavement just above the rocky sand, I surveyed the beach below. There were about a dozen people, children mostly, building sand castles and playing in the gently swishing waves. They were enjoying this stretch of Woodmont Beach. I closed my eyes. I inhaled deeply. I exhaled slowly. And I breathed in the saltwater smell of my childhood days. And I did not cry. Strengthened by this victory, I turned to face the beach houses behind me. They had grown even more enormous since the childhood days of my romping in them in the 50s and 60s. There was Charlie's house. His family was one of the few that lived year round on Beach Street. I swore I could hear the guitar chords he played as he serenaded Benita and me. We'd sit on his colossal wraparound porch, and he sat in that once white wicker chair, ceramic dolphin anchored just above his head. Where was Charlie now, I wondered. Benita would know. Nina, Nina, where are all the people? My reverie was interrupted by my 12-year-old granddaughter who was still facing the beach. Those are all the people, sweetie, I said to her just as it was all those decades ago when it was our beach, mine and Benita's. But I have to confess, I don't remember the sand being this rocky and stony. You know, I guess when you're a child, you endure the pain and anticipation of the pleasure. And what pleasure. You see, from the time I was about 10 years old or so, when school recessed for the summer, the next day, my dad would drive me across town to the beach side of Milford, to Benita's house. I'd have with me my bicycle and one suitcase stuffed with books and bathing suits. I really wanted to bring a lot more clothing, but I didn't want Benita's mother to figure out that I was planning on staying a lot longer than the three days they had agreed upon. I also planned to be very, very well behaved and very, very quiet. She might even forget that I was there. Well, every glorious day unfolded and ended just like the day before. Benita and I would get up very early and we would pretend to have breakfast. That was one of the three rules we had to obey, to eat breakfast. That done, we'd scamper down the two short blocks to the beach. We'd be dressed in our red, white, and blue sailor-themed bathing suits, or maybe our pink floral skirted bathing suits that tied around the neck, books and blankets in tow. We usually were at the beach by 9 o'clock at the latest, because you see, the tide didn't matter to us. High tide, low tide, we enjoyed the beach. If the tide was too low for swimming, we spread our blanket out and we read until the water was deep enough for some serious swimming. <laughs> and swim we did, freestyle, breaststroke, backstroke, <laughs> even the butterfly. But the highlight of our water play was when the motorboats came roaring by. We'd hear them in the distance and then we'd spot the wave and then we'd get ourselves into position because you see timing and position were everything. And then at some instinctively precise moment, we'd pick a wave, lunge into it, and body surf it to shore. On the best days, we hardly had time to position ourselves before another great wave would come roaring in. There were only two things that would get us out of the water, belly scraping low tide and lunchtime. Now, I don't know exactly how we knew it was lunchtime. We didn't wear our Timexes to the beach. Maybe it was the position of the sky, of the sun in the sky. But we paid attention because one of our other rules was that we had to be back at Benita's house for lunch by 1 o'clock. So two very wary, waterlogged, and sunbaked girls would drag back to Benita's house for a nutritious and not particularly memorable lunch. 
but we ate in anticipation of what was to follow. You see, our other rule was that we could not go back into the water until 30 minutes after we had eaten. And did we have plans for those 30 minutes? After lunch, we threw our books into the bike baskets, ran out to the carport, and pedaled off to the Woodmont Library, our declared destination. When we got there, we hurriedly exchanged our books, having decided earlier which books we were going to check out. And then we would ride to our secret destination. When we got there, we'd stop in front of the big black wrought iron gates and look with wonder at our secret playground that loomed before us. A great big white stucco mansion with an orange tiled mansard roof. It sat at the end of the driveway and on the edge of the ocean. It rose out of the water like Atlantis. It was large, it was grand, and it was deserted. With conspiratorial glances at one another, we ride our bikes up the driveway, up the staircase, into the foyer. We'd ride our bikes around in that circular foyer. The cupola would shed down sunlight, the prisms of sunlight onto the black and white tiled floor. It was we rode around as our warm up to the real event of the day. We rode into the kitchen. We rode into the butler's pantry. We rode out the back door onto the concrete pier that jutted for yards into the ocean and ended in a gazebo. A gazebo in the water. We rode around this gazebo, the sea spray splashing our faces, the boys whooshing at the concrete piers behind us, our hearts thumping with excitement but never with fear. Benita had assured me we wouldn't get in trouble even if somebody had seen us. All the kids do this, she assured me. And I believed her, even though I had never seen another kid there. And I may even have seen a no trespassing sign or two. But our ride complete and our half an hour spent dutifully, we'd return to the beach where we would stay until sunset alternating between the reading and the swimming, depending on the tide. At sundown, we would drag ourselves home, have dinner, and then two very weary girls would be tucked into their twin beds. Once in bed, we'd pull the covers over our head and get out our flashlights and read our favorite passages from our favorite books to one another. Now, we read Nancy Drew like all the kids, but we were really into the children's classics. Little Women, A Wind in the Willows, A Secret Garden. And then one day, we got introduced to the Russians. It was on. Crime and Punishment, Dr. Shivago, Anna Karenna, we devoured them all long before high school. Those were glorious days that we shared. And you know, I must have been very, very good because those three days would morph into four and then five. Usually on the fifth day in the evening, my dad would come collect me and bring me home to my family for the weekend. But on Sunday, the rotation would start again. Back to Benita's, the beach, the library, and the mansion. Did I really think that I was schmoozing Benita's mother into extending my stay day after day, week after week, summer after summer? Yes. <laughs> it wasn't until I was much older that I realized that as Benita was an only child and I was the only daughter with three brothers, what better way for two girls to spend their summer <laughs> than have access to the gift of the beach? As we got into high school, our beach days got shorter. We were more involved with part-time summer jobs, uh, family vacations, and doing college campus tours. I was a year older than Benita, so I went to college first. I got married first. I had children first. Benita got divorced first and second, and in between, she became a lawyer. She moved to DC and I was still in Connecticut and when she came to Connecticut, we swam at the Milford Y. When I went to DC, I swam at her private club. And we still read 
with the same ferocity. We would pick a novel every week, and then we'd set a time to talk to one another on the phone on Sunday evening. The call was well worth the cost. We had three things to cover. What did we do during the week? What did we enjoy most about the novel? And we would reminisce about the unacknowledged, privileged kidhood we had shared. On this day, standing on the beach with my 12-year-old granddaughter by my side, I wondered when was the last time I had read a book for pleasure. I couldn't remember the last time that I would inhale novels at the rate of two or three a week. I know when my children were in the developmental stages, I was still reading a lot because they nicknamed me typewriter eyes. It was for the speed at which my eyes moved across the pages. <laughs> but on this day, standing on the beach, remembering without Benita and without crying, it occurred to me that it had been a long time since I had read for pleasure. Now, this wasn't the first time I had returned to the beach since December 20th, 1995. I had come to the beach many times, and before I could park my car, I would be consumed with an uninvited, unexpected torrent of tears that would hold me prisoner in my car. I tried and tried to go back to the beach and sit there and reminisce about the glorious times we had shared, but unsuccessfully. I tried sometimes after I had gone to church, being full with faith, I thought this would sustain me, but I was wrong. All I had room for were the emotions of rage and grief. Rage at the HIV AIDS that snatched Benita from life at the early age of 42. And grief that she and I would never share another swim, another novel, another trespass. Remembering this in this day, I embraced the joy of the days we had shared. And I acknowledged the pain of losing her. And I remembered the last day that I spent with Benita in the hospital room in Washington, DC. She gestured weakly with a nod of her head to a book that lay on her nightstand. Read that, she said. You'll love the phrasing, beach music. I read it. She was right. I loved it. She died. And on this day, strengthened by the memories and encouraged by the times we shared, I decided that on the way home, I would stop by the library to see what good reads the librarian might recommend. Thank you. <laughs>